under arrest, the man wanted in the US for the weekend terror attacks. Ahmad Rahami was captured, injured but alive in a police shootout following a huge manhunt. Also on News at 10 tonight. She certainly can't be accused of currying favour in the leaders' club. Theresa May tells her first UN conference, we won't be taking more refugees. The ceasefire is over with more attacks in besieged Aleppo in Syria tonight. There is shelling in Aleppo right now and plumes of smoke rising up from the rebel-held areas. Three months after Brexit, the political party that is betting its future on a campaign to take us back into the EU. And he ain't heavy, he's my brother. The latest remarkable twist in the story of the Brownlee brothers. I don't think I can ever repay uh, Alistair for, for what he did. You know, it's an incredible act of sportsmanship. This is ITV News at 10 with Tom Bradby. Good evening. For the past 48 hours, the most wanted man in New York, home this week to the leaders of the world, had given police the slip. He was described as armed and dangerous after explosions over the weekend in New York City and nearby New Jersey. Well, today, Ahmad Rahami, an American citizen born in Afghanistan, was captured in a shootout. Believe it or not, the police found him asleep in a pub doorway. What they haven't found, not yet anyway, is a clear motive for the attacks. Uh, there you see the suspect right there, apparently conscious. These were the moments immediately after the frantic manhunt for Ahmed Khan Rahami came to an end. The suspect handcuffed on a stretcher, a wound to his shoulder, waiting to be taken to hospital. The chase had begun down a local street after he'd been recognized by police officers. There's the guy shooting a gun. Shots fired. Shots fired. What followed was a dramatic shootout. The gunfire clearly audible on this mobile phone footage, filmed by a passing motorist. An image from a few minutes later shows Rahami on the ground. His shirt pulled up amid fears he was wearing a suicide vest. At this stage, it appears he was operating alone, not as a member of a terrorist cell. There is uh, no other individual we're looking for at this point in time, and that's very important to answer your question. Uh, second, uh, vigilance is called for, and it's very, very important if people see anything unusual, particularly an unattended package, that they report it immediately. Hey, everybody, get off of the street! Let's go! Get off the street! Rahami is linked by fingerprints and surveillance footage to the pressure cooker bombs that were planted in New York and New Jersey over the weekend. The one that did the most damage detonated on Saturday night in Chelsea, a fashionable neighborhood in New York. Early this morning in the town of Elizabeth in New Jersey, five more improvised devices were discovered in a backpack. As one was being handled by a robot, there was an accidental detonation. The president has praised the quick reaction of police. I want to take this opportunity to reassure the people in this city, this region, and Americans across our country that our counterterrorism and law enforcement professionals at every level, federal, state, and local, are working together around the clock to prevent attacks and to keep us safe. The first device was targeting a charity race in Seaside Park in New Jersey. It exploded but caused no injuries. That same evening, 80 miles away at 8.30, there was a blast in Manhattan. A sweep of the area discovered another bomb four blocks away. Then, in the early hours of this morning, the additional devices were found at the train station in Elizabeth. Even with Rahami's capture, New York remains a city on high alert. This is the week of the UN General Assembly, with over 100 world leaders staying on Manhattan. Tonight, as police search his house for clues to his motive and to his wider connections, the question remains, was he operating as a lone wolf or was Rahami taking orders from overseas? 
uh, and Robert joins us now from New York. Robert, you essentially posed the question there. Is there any sense of, of this man's journey from Afghanistan to these attacks and what it involved? Well, all of that is a subject now of intense uh, police investigations. We know that Rahami was born in Afghanistan. We believe he may have moved to the U.S. in 2002 when he was age 14, moved uh, with his family. And we, uh, according to some sources, he has made regular trips back to Afghanistan in recent years. So whether he met extremists there or whether he was self-radicalized here in the U.S., we simply don't know. Why all of this matters, Tom, in this intensely political season is because already tonight Donald Trump is using this as an example of what he likes to call his Trojan horse theory, that there are thousands or even tens of thousands of Muslim men entering the U.S., poorly vetted, who could be potential terrorists. Now, Hillary Clinton is firing back uh, on social media tonight, saying that it's exactly that type of fierce anti-immigrant rhetoric that, in her words, is giving aid and comfort to groups like the Islamic State. But I think what we can say tonight is what's happened here and in New Jersey is changing the narrative of the campaign and probably giving some added momentum to Donald Trump. OK, Robert from New York, thank you very much indeed. So shortly after that drama was played out on the streets of New Jersey, back in New York itself, our Prime Minister had a few complex issues of her own to negotiate. It was her first meeting with the world's leaders at the UN, and her message clearly wasn't designed to court popularity. Countries must be able to control their own borders, she said, and we will not be taking in any more refugees. <laughs> Britain after Brexit would not be an inward-looking country, so said Theresa May when she walked into Downing Street. And here at the United Nations, the newly installed Prime Minister met the outgoing Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. But her first visit means she can show the world who she is and what she wants. The big topic here in New York, for very good reasons, is migration. And Britain's response, she said, is not to open its doors to more migrants. I think that uncontrolled migration is not in the interests of the migrants themselves. It's not in the interests of refugees who may find that they see less support as a result. It's not in the interests of uh, the countries that people are coming from, travelling through or trying to get to. So expect more British help in and around Syria, but no more refugees to the UK. This was the Syrian border with Turkey today. And as they do every day, mothers carry children, fathers push wheelchairs, families carry everything they can manage, all travelling in one direction, away from Syria. These are the people who look to world leaders for help. Make no mistake, additional efforts are urgently needed. And as we meet, an estimated 65 million people have been forcibly displaced from their homes including more than 21 million people who have fled across international borders. How to stop people from fleeing is perhaps the biggest challenge for Mrs May and other world leaders. Mahir Rashid lived in the Syrian capital, Damascus. He's now at a refugee camp on the Greek island of Lesbos. His reason for fleeing with his family was simple and stark. If I didn't come here, I'm maybe now I am dead or in army fighting with... I don't want fight. Back in New York, there were words of good intent. Refugees and migrants are not to be seen or burdened. They offer great potential. The Declaration on Refugees has been signed, but the work on an agreement is only just beginning. Chris Ship News at 10 at the United Nations. Well, whatever Mrs May's fellow leaders thought about her solutions to the migration crisis, there is no doubt the problem remains a critical one. Last year, more than a million refugees and migrants arrived in Europe by sea. This year, that number is significantly down, with nearly 300,000 arrivals so far. But that is still an average of 1,400 people every single day. The UK has promised to take in 20,000 Syrian refugees from camps by 2020, plus an additional 3,000 children who arrive in Europe alone. So far, 2,800 Syrian refugees have been resettled here, but no unaccompanied minors. So no real sign of Mrs May softening her position, it seems. Uh, Chris uh, joins us from the UN, as you can see. Chris, you obviously flew over with Mrs May and chatted to her, I assume, on the plane. Is there any sense behind the scenes that our position could or, or in any way change? 
Tom, I think as we're coming to expect from this Prime Minister, we learn uh, a little bit more from her a little bit at a time. And I think what became quite clear on the plane on the way over here and the conversations that we were having with the Prime Minister was that at least on this issue of migration, there would be no change from the direction that David Cameron was taking. So no change on the numbers that uh, the UK will resettle from the Syrian region. That's 20,000 uh, by the year 2020. No change on the number of unaccompanied minors, that's 3,000 uh, of those. And no change either on the, the, the focus of the aid and the resources which is in the countries and the area from which these uh, refugees are coming. I thought there was a little bit of difference in terms of she said uh, that the UK must be able to secure its borders. She was certainly more firm on that than David Cameron was. Perhaps that's inevitable given what happened uh, in the EU referendum and the messages that she was getting from voters uh, during that. Uh, but I think, you know, she's now here. She's got a big speech here tomorrow at the UN General Assembly. I think people really know, want to know what it is that makes Mrs May tick. Well, Chris, you mentioned that big speech tomorrow. Of course, she's been to the G20, but I suppose this is her first moment on the sort of big stage for the broader uh, spectrum of world leaders. Have she managed to get any sense of what she's likely to say, what tone she's likely to strike? I think the difference between this, this event and the G20, um, apart from the fact this is bigger, there's 190 countries uh, here. The G G20, I think she was able to focus on Brexit, but here I think world leaders want to know a little bit more about Mrs May. What sort of leader will she be uh, on the world stage? What issues will she care about? Now, it's her maiden speech uh, here at the United Nations General Assembly tomorrow. Of course, it's President Obama's last one. Leaders come and uh, leaders go, of course. But what I think uh, Mrs May will say that she will focus on issues like migration, as we've been discussing tonight, but also issues that she dealt with as Home Secretary, like uh, terrorism and also modern day slavery. So she's revealing a little bit, Tom, but not too much and not too quickly. OK, Chris, thank you very much indeed. Now, many of the refugees in Europe elsewhere are, of course, Syrians who fled their country's long and bitter civil war. Over the weekend, the American-led airstrike on what was supposed to be an Islamic State position ended up killing more than 60 of President Assad's troops. Today, our Ministry of Defence said an unmanned RAF drone had been part of that attack. Well, the attack was among many that threatened Syria's ceasefire and today it was finally pronounced well and truly over after only a week. People in the city of Aleppo have told us the shelling is like rain. Normal life has resumed. Aleppo is Syria's largest city and its most populous. It's a key rebel stronghold lying more than 200 miles north of Damascus. The city became a key battleground in 2012 when rebel fighters tried to oust government forces and gain control over northern Syria. Rebel forces now control much of the east, while the government controls the west. From Aleppo, Bill Neely of our American sister station NBC News has sent this report. Gunfire near Aleppo's front line and hours of explosions too. This isn't the silence of a ceasefire. There is shelling in Aleppo right now and plumes of smoke rising up from the rebel-held areas across this front line. It's deadly inside the city and dangerous driving in, 200 miles from Damascus. The ISIS front line is about a mile over there. Jihadi fighters linked to Al-Qaeda, about a mile in that direction. This is a very narrow, safe passage in. The truce was meant to open the way to UN food deliveries, but it's clear the war that caused this destruction hasn't stopped and the aid for tens of thousands hasn't arrived. The Syrian troops based here accuse the rebels of breaking the ceasefire repeatedly. They were attacked, they say, this morning by rebels trying to retake this area, and three of their men were killed. Each side blames the other. Children pay the price. They've just fled an area under fire, a local charity feeding them. Across the front line, rebels claim regime warplanes dropped barrel bombs here today. Children injured. If true, the US-Russia ceasefire deal is crumbling fast. Peace, food and hope here are all in short supply. The seven-day ceasefire is now officially over. There was some reduction in violence, certainly fewer Russian and Syrian airstrikes. But in truth, this was a ceasefire in name only and now it's finished. And the fear now is of a full-scale onslaught by rebels or regime and that this city will once again 
become a bloodbath. Bill Neely, NBC News for News at 10 in Aleppo. Since Bill compiled that report, all hell has, quite frankly, broken loose in and around Aleppo. An aid convoy has been blown up 12 miles from Aleppo province, killing at least 12 people working for the Syrian Red Crescent. 18 of the 31 trucks were hit. So too was a Red Crescent warehouse. It is not clear at this stage whose missiles or bombs were to blame. But local monitoring groups say that, all told, more than 30 people have been killed near Aleppo this evening. Back here. For the f past five years, it has been clear that taxi driver Christopher Halliwell was the man who killed Becky Godden, a passenger he picked up back in 2003. We know that because Mr Halliwell himself actually confessed to police five years ago. But because the police didn't caution him properly at the time, the case against him was thrown out. Finally, with a new judge and new evidence, he was found guilty today. It only took the jury two hours, though his case may not have been helped by the fact that he chose to act as his own barrister. He laughed as he was found guilty, Christopher Halliwell's second murder conviction. In all likelihood, as he recognises, he will now die in prison. If, if it goes to court and I'm found guilty, that's it. They lock me up and throw me away the key. There was little doubt that Becky Godden was killed by Halliwell and buried in a shallow grave in Gloucestershire. He admitted to it, but feebly denied it during the trial, an action that only delayed justice for his victim and her family. We have waited over five years for this momentous day. It has been an extremely painful journey, but today we've received the justice that has felt like an eternity coming for our beautiful little girl, Becky. The trail of justice that brought Becky Godden's killer to court was far from straightforward. She was last seen alive outside a nightclub in Swindon in January 2003. It was eight years before Halliwell led them to where her body lay buried in a field in Gloucestershire. But in 2012, the charge against Halliwell of murdering Becky Godden was sensationally dropped because of a police blunder. Detective Superintendent Steve Fulcher later resigned. In November 2014, however, soil samples found on a shovel in Halliwell's home directly linked him to the burial site. He was charged again and this time brought to trial. That police mistake was well-intentioned. Steve Fulcher failed to caution Halliwell because at the time he believed Halliwell's other victim might still be alive and Sean O'Callaghan was his priority. Do you have some sympathy with what Detective Superintendent Fulcher has been through? Absolutely. I mean, they're very difficult circumstances that, that he faced. A live investigation, he wasn't aware whether Sean was alive or dead. He made a very difficult decision. It's not really for me to comment on whether he made the right decision, but hopefully there's some vindication today for the families. Police believe Halliwell may have other victims. If true, he'll have plenty of time to confess, as the judge indicated today that he faces the possibility of a whole life sentence. For Becky's family, footage of her happy at her mother's wedding is how she will be remembered. Justice was all they were seeking, and at long last, it is secured. Rupert Evelyn, News at 10, Bristol. Now, they have tried arguing, protesting and striking. Today, a group of junior doctors from England went to court to ask a judge to rule on whether the Health Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, has the power to impose the hotly contested new contract. Our health editor, Rachel Younger, uh, is here to try and work that out. Well, perhaps more precisely, let's talk about the impact. Is this, whichever way this decision goes, likely to, or this case goes, likely to have any impact on the strikes? Well, for it to have an impact, the junior doctors have got to win it. And you won't be surprised, as many of these court cases do, this comes down largely to language. You may remember Jeremy Hunt talked about the junior doctors having forced him into imposing this very controversial contract on them. Since this case was brought, he's modified his language somewhat. He's talked about hospitals introducing and implementing the changes. But the junior doctors say that doesn't disguise the fact he out acted outside of his powers by trying to force through these changes upon them. They also say even if he was within the law there, there is insufficient sufficient evidence that seven day working which this contract was designed to help the NHS achieve mm. would actually reduce the number of patient deaths at the weekend now Jeremy Hunt disputes that he believes he has a very robust case here but whether or not he wins or loses 
I think the timing is very tight. We expect a decision to be handed down on the 28th of September. That's just seven days before the first five-day strike, just as hospitals will be beginning to contact patients to tell them that their operations are due to be postponed or indeed cancelled. And I think what may in the end be even more important is a meeting this weekend of the Junior Doctors Committee at the British Medical Association. And that's because there is mounting evidence at the moment that a number of junior doctors feel these five-day strikes are too long. And in the end, that may be just as defining as to what actually happens next. OK, Richard, we will see, but thank you very much indeed. It is fair to say that most Lib Dems don't view the last year or so as a vintage period in their history, having gone, as they did, from being in government with 57 MPs to the fourth largest party in the UK with the sum total of eight. But today, their leader, Tim Farron, told us of what he saw as a potential way back. He wants the Lib Dems to be the party to take the UK back into the European Union. Yes, he does. Our political correspondent, Paul Brandt, uh, is in Westminster. Paul... Uh, Given where we are in politics at the moment, this is quite a bold move. What's he been saying about it in detail? Yeah, Tom, I mean, you probably remember David Cameron once telling the Conservatives to stop banging on about Europe. Well, the new EU obsessives on the block are most definitely the Lib Dems, though for very different reasons. You could almost imagine them here adopting the EU flag as their logo. So desperate are they to nail their colours to its mast because Tim Farron clearly feels that after the EU referendum, as a pro-European party, they've got a new purpose here, if you like. And today their members voted in favour of this idea of having a second EU referendum on the terms of Brexit. Tim Farron saying he kind of mourns Brexit, almost like a, a loss in his own family. He wants the British public to have one last chance to say, actually, we're not going to go through with this once they've seen the deal that's been negotiated. And in fact, he almost seemed to go one step further than that with me today for the first time when I asked him in Brighton whether he would be willing to kind of rejoin the EU once we've left. He said it's a possibility. If the, if the deal was good enough, I mean, I think one of the great sadnesses is that we have the best deal on offer at the moment. We're in the European Union, which is wonderful for peace and security and for our economy, access to the single market and all the rest of it. So if we were to rejoin the European Union, it would have to be on the good terms that we currently have. Paul, of course, you've got his big speech tomorrow with only eight MPs nationally. He could do with making a splash. What's he going to say, do you think? Yeah, got some of the speech uh, here, Tom. A couple of interesting policy ideas. One is to add a penny, effectively, uh, onto national insurance to invest more money in the NHS and social care. The other two scrap SAS SATs tests uh, in primary schools, which could be popular with parents uh, and teachers. Though, overall, big emphasis on the EU. They think that's the attention grabber. And as you say, they need the attention right now. OK, Paul, we'll be covering it tomorrow. But for now, thank you very much indeed. Now, the former England footballer Paul Gascoigne found himself on the receiving end of some stern, but you might argue quite sensible words from a judge today, as well as a £1,000 fine, after he admitted making a racist remark to his own security guard. Gascoigne later apologised for what he said during a show he was doing in Wolverhampton last November. But the judge said today, we live in the 21st century. Grow up and live in it or keep your mouth closed, Mr Gascoigne. Pithy, if nothing else. One last statistic now from Rio that demonstrates just what a good Games Paralympics GP have had. The athletes are heading home overnight on two planes. They couldn't fit all the medal winners into one. 147 of them at the final count, more than half the squad. But can it ever be this good again? There was, after all, no Russia and other countries are said to be catching up. The athletes would say, of course, yes, it absolutely can. For 11 days, red, white and blue bled gold, silver and bronze. The best funded team ever, producing their most impressive results yet. Nearly half the squad return with a medal. The efforts of London 2012 paling into comparison. The benchmark for future Paralympians will now be the heights that they soared to in Brazil. I think we will be in people's minds for a long, long time. And it's hard sometimes to emulate the success that we had at home games and Team GB did really well and Paralympics GB did really well. So I think other countries are going to start being scared of us. Rio was Britain's most successful Paralympics since 1988 with 147 medals, 64 of them gold. But can that be matched in Tokyo? Russia will surely return from their doping ban and be back competing. 
some of our best athletes will have retired. Wheelchair racer David Weir has already said no more games. And it's likely that many other countries will up their investment to try and emulate Britain's success. As the competitors celebrated at last night's closing ceremony, decisions over future British funding are already being made. Paralympics GB received £73 million over the last four-year cycle. It's not yet certain what their allocation will be ahead of Tokyo, but officials admit they've no guarantee that it will be increased. Clearly all the sports and the partners are, are submitting their Tokyo strategies currently. Um, I don't know if you know where funding levels will, will land, if you like, for Tokyo. Um, but what we do know is that we'll do the best that we can with the funding that's available. Those financial concerns pale into comparison to the ones Rio overcame. The city was out of money, the games in crisis before they began. But the clouds lifted and Rio salvaged a games to remember. With the Olympic Park now empty, most of the British squad flying home tonight will already be turning their thoughts to what they might achieve in 2020. Those who did not perform well here will be more nervous than most, wondering if their funding will even survive. Tokyo will be a very different experience for both Paralympians and Olympians. But as the Brazilian odyssey ends, the hope is that the Japanese one will ultimately be just as successful. Richard Pallon, News at 10, Rio de Janeiro. Now, there must surely be moments when the Brownlee brothers irritate each other. They are brothers, after all. But if so, there is precious little sign of it, and they remain a slightly awe-inspiring example of, to be blunt, the power of love. They had their moment in the sun in Rio a month ago, triathlon gold for Alistair, silver for Johnny. But they finished their season in Mexico overnight our time, with Alistair sacrificing a possible world title to help his younger brother cross the line in the 10-kilometre run. Johnny had run out of energy in the Mexican heat. They still managed to finish second and third, though. And right now he seems to have lost control of his legs. Just a few hundred metres from the family, Johnny Brownlee's legs start to wobble and in the Mexican heat, his body simply comes to a halt. This is a horrible sight. Jonathan Brownlee has Overtaken for first place on the verge of giving up and then his older brother Alistair comes to the rescue. Once Alistair kind of grabbed hold of me, my thought was, please, just, just leave me alone, you know, I want to lay down, I want to stop running. Um, and then, the other, then a bit later on I thought, just get, do everything you can to cross that finish line and it felt like it was going on forever. Johnny and Alistair Brownlee crossed the line together in Rio to take Olympic gold and silver. All their lives they've trained together on the Yorkshire Dales where they live. They've competed together and pushed each other. Those who've known them since they were boys aren't surprised that one would sacrifice his own chance of winning a race. I was thinking, he can't just drop him and leave him behind now. He's, he's done the hard bit, he's got to take him with him. But I think you could just tell he was talking to him all the way around. He was really shouting at him, come on, come on, come on, you've got to go, you've got to go, keep going, keep going. As long as they've been competing, they've been rivals as well as friends. But this time for Alistair, it was all about getting his little brother across the line. I don't think I can ever repay uh, Alistair for, for what he did. He said he would have done it to everyone, but I don't know. I, I think there's something more than that. You know, he was um, we were incredibly loyal to each other. We've gone through a lot together this year, you know, two Olympic medals, all the training before that. And, uh, you know, for what he did to me, um, I'll never be able to say thank you enough. To be honest, I wish the uh, flipping idiot had just paced it right and crossed the finish line first. So, yeah, I mean, very nice, but, yeah, I mean, he, he won it easy. He could have he jogged that last 2K and, and won the race. Johnny made a full recovery, and the records show he finished in second place with his brother behind him. The record books for once don't tell the whole story of a brother's sacrifice. Damon Green, News at 10. Story. Let's just take a quick look at what might be happening tomorrow. As we said, the athletes of Paralympics GB are now heading home. These photos have just come in. <laughs> they will be arriving back at Heathrow in two planes. One will land at nine in the morning, a second at about one o'clock. And remember Ravi Shankar, the Indian musician who brought sitar playing to the wider world in the 1960s. Tomorrow we'll be hearing from his daughter Anushka, who has just completed the one and only opera he was writing when he died. You get it? All on this programme. I'll be here for that and much more tomorrow. But for now, good night and thank you very much for watching.